And good morning, Aldersgate friends. We are Cindy and Ruth, and we're connecting with you at our home on Mercer Island, Washington. We just finished some gardening. It's a beautiful day, and we look forward to having church with you. Our God calls on us to join the witness. In today's worship, we see how Peter relies on God to select Judas's replacement. We worship here at Aldersgate United Methodist Church, and we are happy and grateful you are with us. All are welcome here. Please say hello in our chat. Join us in the call to worship. Please respond with Ruth as all. This is the day that God has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship the one who turns our sorrow into joy our despair into hope, our doubt into faith. Let us feel the wind of the Spirit refresh our lives. Come, let us worship. Let us pray. God, God our source of light and life, you lead the way to courage, kindness, generosity, and love. You call us to be your people and to live in community with one another, always moving to a place of wholeness. God, your love makes us whole. Help us to receive your love with open hearts so that we may become attuned to your will and your way. We ask that you strengthen us as your people, gathered to praise and to serve you. Amen. Amen.
church it's miss jen and i am here at the church on our with our beautiful grounds and flowers and i just wanted to bring today's children's moment to you and when i was reading the scriptures for this week and i read psalm 1 and it talked about the tree by the river it made me think of this book that i've recently found and i just love um it is called the tree and me and it is by karina lichen and she is an author from the Pacific Northwest. And this book has just beautiful pictures and a wonderful message. So I'm not going to read the whole thing, but if you ever want to borrow it from me, please reach out. I'm happy to lend it out. And here we go. And because there is a tree in me, there is wind and rain and dirt and a river with fish and a sky too. The tree in me is strong. It bends and has roots that go deep down to where other roots reach up towards their own trunk branch crown and sky too. Because there is a tree and a sky and a sun in me, I can see that there is also a tree in you. I hope that you can hear those words and see the layers of all the different parts of us and parts of our community and how we're all connected and that we're connected with nature. Will you pray with me? Thank you, God, for the trees, for the branches, for the fruits, for the bark. Thank you for all of us and for the growth and the letting go and the strength that you give us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bye, church. Walk down the street, make you hold my hand, want to lift you up your feet, be a superman, superman.
this morning is in celebration of Landa and Peter Narmita's 45th anniversary. Happy anniversary. Let us pray. God, our creator, we give thanks that we are here together, that we live this day. We come with praise, celebration of the birth of Norma Bush's great-grandson, George, and hope for renewal as we pray towards reopenings. We give thanks for believers everywhere, for that great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us. May your presence be known to each of us at the point of our need. We lift our hurts, our disappointments, our hopes, and our dreams. We come seeking guidance for decisions about our relationships and vocational choices, and about our communal life together. Especially we pray towards the future you desire for our mutual flourishing, and as we prepare for reopenings towards hybrid online and in-person worship services. Grant us grace, patience, skills, leadership, energy of love, and renewed spirit of oneness in your body. We pray also for upcoming annual conferences across the United Methodist Connection and for the retiring of bishops as well as for our denomination facing difficulties and challenges. May we trust your prayer for us that we will be your holy people by the love you witness to us and as we practice that witness of love. We come with concerns about our health or the health of others as we lift up our siblings and friends needing healing from cancer and the treatments towards fullness of life. We pray for Andy and recovery from surgery to recover the broken arm back to its position of wellness as part of his whole body, mind, and spirit. We come in grief about the losses in our lives. We continue to pray for Sheila and for Colleen's friend and families exper experiencing brokenness of tragedy and grief. Hear our prayers, O oh God. Help us sort out the different influences and opportunities in our lives as we strive to live for you. We pray that we will be numbered among the blessed, that we'll be among those who are the poor in spirit, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who show mercy, the pure in heart, and the peacemakers. We pray for the people of India and remember Vince's friend Hara amongst those experiencing loss. We cry out for the end to violence in the Mideast, including the death of 60 schoolgirls in Afghanistan and the countless deaths from violence in Palestine and Israel. We know what is required of us, and we pray in faith in your power, 
in hope for your kingdom, and in love for one another. Amen. And now let us share in the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Mother who is in heaven and within us, we call upon your names, your wisdom come, your will be done in all the spaces in which you dwell. Give us each day sustenance and perseverance. Remind us of our limits as we give grace to the limits of others. Separate us from the temptation of empire and deliver us into community. For you are the dwelling place within us, the empowerment around us, and the celebration among us, now and forever. Amen. Good morning, church. We are Steve and Jean Rummel, connecting with you from our home in Newcastle, Washington. Draw near and hear how Matthias is selected to replace Judas as Jesus' apostle in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verses 15 to 17 and 21 to 26. We're reading from the Inclusive Bible. One day, Peter stood up in the midst of the believers, a gathering of perhaps 120. Sisters and brothers, he said, the saying in scripture uttered long ago by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of David was destined to be fulfilled in Judas, the one who guided those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and had been given a share in this ministry. It is necessary, therefore, that one of those who accompanied us all the time that Jesus moved among us. From the baptism of John until the day Jesus was taken up from us should be named as witness with us to the resurrection. At that, they nominated two, Joseph, also called Barsabbas, or Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, O oh God, you can read the hearts of people. Show us which of these two you have chosen to occupy this apostolic ministry, replacing Judas, who turned away and went his own way. They then drew lots between the two. The choice fell to Matthias, who was added to the eleven apostles. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever cast lots to make a decision? In today's story in Acts, what is described is the disciples casting lots to make their final decision, probably because they are having difficulties choosing between two people who they have already discerned both have the qualifications they have already named. That is, having been witness to Jesus since the time of John's baptism to his ascension. The assumption is that casting lots would take away any other influences and in they're making a choice and leave it in God's hands, and that whatever the outcome is that it is the will of God. Today's story describes how the disciples cast lots to make their decision as to who between two people would take the place of Judas amongst the 12 disciples. It is not a prescription that just because that's how the disciples did it thousands of years ago, that we practice the same methods today, and we don't practice that method today in our churches when it comes to decision making. For example, we do not cast lots to see which pastor in our conference would be appointed to Eldersgate or any local church. Though sometimes I've heard from both clergy and laity that under our appointment system, it can feel random in some cases at some times. I do know that the cabinet and bishop actively pray through appointments just as the local church needs to be praying during the appointment season. If you have never watched the movie Two Popes with Anthony Hopkins and Jonathan Price, I highly recommend it. It has some understandings of decision-making related to resignation or abdication from the role as Pope in the Catholic Church as more than individualistic decision-making and communal in nature. A really well-made movie. I actually watched it twice for the great script as well as the acting. The movie is available on Netflix. Anyways, casting lots was a practice that is described as being used in the early, middle, and modern periods of Christian church, and now is no longer practiced, and actually it being described in our story today is the last time it appears in the Bible. 
This description of casting lots and choosing a disciple occurred in between the time of Jesus' ascension and Pentecost. We know that Jesus remained with the disciples 40 days after his resurrection and before his ascension. This casting lots happens between Jesus' ascension and Pentecost, so before the disciples receive the gift of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. We understand from the Pentecost story that all disciples who were present received the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and the indwelling of wisdom is gifted to help them and us discern through uncertainties as a community. You can see from the descriptions in today's story that women would have also qualified as those who had been present, like Matthias and Joseph, from the baptism of John to Jesus' ascension as necessary to witness to Jesus' resurrection. Again, this is a description, so we are not prescribing either that women should or could not be disciples and or that casting lots is the type of decision-making process that we need or want to use. It's ironic that Mary was the first named apostle as the first witness to the risen Christ, and it was her who went to witness to the other disciples, and they did not believe her till they witnessed the risen Christ for themselves. Why wasn't she named as a disciple along with Matthias and Joseph? Again, a description and yet something the church interpreted in our past as a prescription as Apostle Paul himself thought women should not speak in the church. Again, a description of his times, not a prescription, and yet the church continued to prescribe such understandings as biblical. What we can learn from these descriptions is how the church often has fallen to using the text in scripture to prescribe violence against both humanity and against God, a violence against the sacred worth of all that God calls God's beloved. Often church history reveals to us by what decisions we have made, more often than not, what we did not want to do more than what we wanted to do. Our yielding to God's will for us to love one another are hard choices and not so easy. After this description of casting lots, we don't know much about what happened with Matthias, as it is the last time we hear of him, like so many disciples that are not named or that we have no details about in the Bible. And that does not mean that Matthias did not live a life bearing witness and bearing fruit of God's love for the world. That also says to us that there are many women disciples that may have been excluded in the Bible, but that is not an indication or sign that they are not disciples, followers, friends of Jesus. The lack of such description has, though, caused a deeper struggle for women as these descriptions of the early disciples being all men has stuck around and into policies of the church and remains still so in parts of Christianity even today. Interestingly, the random form of casting lots to determine an outcome is called claromancy, coming from the Greek word kleros, meaning lot, inheritance. We get our words clerk, clergy, and cleric from kleros, probably because in ancient times, those positions were originally chosen by lot and or inherited. The representation of 12 disciples goes back to representation of Israel of 12 tribes, each with their lots and inheritance, and oftentimes casting lots was practiced to determine how lots and inheritance was divided. In those times and that context, women also were excluded from lots and inheritances. Another description in today's reading we hear is that the disciples prayed before casting lots. This praying together was part of their practice of making decisions, and that practice still continues today in our church traditions. Praying has lasted the test of time and remains a practice in our traditions over thousands of years. Prayer by nature is also relational. It is a means of grace in and through and by which we can experience the holy. 
In today's lectionary reading in the Gospel of John chapter 17, we hear that Jesus himself prayed for his disciples before his crucifixion as he discerned and made decisions. The disciples have that experience of Jesus praying for them as he faced his own decisions after that last supper with commanding them to love one another as he loved them. We cannot underestimate the impact of Jesus' prayer on them and us as listeners today. When we are facing decisions in our lives, this prayer of Jesus remembers us into trusting that our lives and our decisions will bear fruit. Last week, we heard Jesus talking to us about how to order our lives, how others will know that we are his students, disciples, followers, friends. Quote, just as I loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my students, my disciples, by the witness of your love. Jesus' prayer for the disciples offers words of promise to his disciples. There are three parts to this prayer and promise each of which is important for us today. First, Jesus' prayer is honest and transparent. He speaks truth to us. He speaks the truth that life is both beautiful, wonderful, and difficult and painful. He's not trying to dismiss the reality of how hard the world can be for both the disciples back then as well as for us now. He's not covering up the realities of this world both then and now. Jesus knows that his departure will prove immensely challenging for his disciples. Jesus is being both empathetic and compassionate. Often it's easier to fall into a false positivity than name and listen to the challenging realities of others. False positivity can do harm by putting others' realities that we really oftentimes have no real understandings about under erasure. False positivity lacks empathy and compassion and can be a form of gaslighting. It is empathy and compassion that moves us from our positions of our reality into the other's own words and understandings of their realities as authentic. It's respecting truths as shared that is different from our own. It sees the dignity and being of the other. Jesus is not offering false positivity in his prayer. Jesus has compassion on us. Jesus is not providing an escape from life's difficulties. Jesus, by naming the realities of this world and offers support to flourish amid them. Jesus prayed, quote, I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil ones. John chapter 17, verse 15. How much easier if Jesus just took the disciples with him and they didn't have to need protection from the evil one. Yet Jesus did not promise that. Jesus asked for God's protection of them against all the evils of the world. This prayer helps us to recognize that Jesus understood that this world can be difficult, painful, and chaotic, and stormy, and that faith will keep us grounded even through it all. The kind of faith Jesus desires for is not the kind that thinks everything makes sense and the world stops becoming a challenging place for us just because we say we have faith. Jesus promises the disciples not that they are exempt from the struggles of this world, but that they are not alone in those struggles. What I find so inspiring about today's story of the disciples gathering in this time after the ascension and before Pentecost, which often in our tradition is seen as the time of the dark night of the soul, that time when we can feel we are completely abandoned and alone, is that they gathered, they flocked. I listened this past week in a Zoom conference about people's different responses to survive crisis and or trauma, and specifically anti-Asian hate. I was familiar with the responses of flight, fight, and freeze, but I had not known about flock. As the word indicates, flocking is coming together so that we are not alone. It's a response that can bring those experiencing trauma to come together towards greater solidarity. 
So it's inspiring to witness how the disciples, facing the crisis and challenges of Jesus no longer being with them, flocks together, and to add to their flocking someone to take the place of Judas. Nadia Boltz Weber, the author of the book we are reading on Wednesday morning study group, reminds Christians that often we think of faith individualistically, that one needs just enough faith. But she would say faith is more a collective enough or sufficient faith. Having faith is a team sport. She says with a Texas draw, you all have enough faith together. Enough faith, sufficient faith for the community. Lastly, in Jesus' prayer, and please read the beautiful prayer in John chapter 17, verses 6 through 19, often referred to as the high priestly prayer. There are two terms. The first is given, which occurs nine times in this passage, 17 in this chapter in John, and 75 times in John's larger gospel. What is given? Well, just about everything. And most prominently, the witness of God in Jesus which is sufficient for our own witness and testimony of God, of God's love in Christ Jesus. The second term to notice is the word world or cosmos in Greek. The word the gospel writer of John uses is our well-versed chapter 3, verse 16 of John, that God so loved the world, that God so loved the cosmos, we are reminded that God loves this difficult, broken, suffering, painful world. This world as it is, is beloved of God. And the disciples and us today are called and sent precisely in and into this world to bear witness to the truth that God loves the whole world, cosmos, even when the world runs contrary and in conflict to God's will and desire. In Jesus' prayer, the honesty that this life can be difficult and that God promised to be with us amid the brokenness so that we not only survive but actually flourish and that God intends to use us wherever we are to work for the good of this world God loves so much is good news. We are reminded that we are sent out into the world with a sense of purpose, of participating in the will of God. The gift we receive is this grace of Jesus praying for us, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the witness of God in Christ. That is more than sufficient prevenient grace as we Methodists like to name it, the grace that goes before us. Jesus continues the prayer asking God that the disciples and all future disciples, so that includes us. How amazing is that? that God would, quote, sanctify them in your truth. The word translated here as sanctified is the same word translated in the other Jesus prayer that he taught us to pray. The word we use in that prayer is hallowed, which means that God is actually setting us apart and making us holy, sanctified in order to serve the world. This is different from when we are being sanctimonious and full of ourselves. Rather, to be sanctified is to be full of the Holy Spirit. What a gift to trust that it's not a matter of whether God will put us to work, but rather how God will put us to work. God has, is, and will continue to invite us to make this world that God so loves a more beautiful, inclusive, healed, filled with joy, reign of justice and peace, a trustworthy place. Maybe for us, it may be we are praying for someone else. Maybe it will be through creating spaces of grace by solidarity with someone vulnerable, inviting someone to our online service to hear the good news of God's abundant love for all of us, bar none. Maybe it will be the ways we love not just our own little ones or the love of our own lives or those who bless us, but how we love where love is challenging, where reciprocity and reconciliation is still at work. Maybe it's love in the midst of clashes where we are all being perfected in God's love. 
Love is hard because it's a commandment we practice with real people in real time, in real life, and not just words we hear spoken to disciples thousands of years ago. It's a call to all of us, specifically in and through who we are and what we do. We all need grace to practice loving. We need grace between the space in which we understand that we are recipients of God's amazing love and between those spaces with one another where we are not yet reciprocating such radical love with one another. Grace creates spaces in which we can keep growing to love one another in our imperfections. Love is easier in word than in deed. Remember someone from this week that helped you to experience this grace and receive love. Remember also the places around the world, including India and Palestine, the parts of our world experiencing violence and death, and that God loves in the midst of those challenges. I love the quote by the priest James Martin I saw this week. Quote, Jesus never said, feed the hungry if only they have papers. Clothe the naked only if they're from this country. Welcome the stranger only if there is zero risk. Help the poor only if it's convenient. convenient. Love the neighbor only if they look like you. Whatever decisions we make each day, how to love, how to live God's will for us, to love one another as God so loved the world, we are gifted with the grace of Jesus having included us in his prayer. Jesus' prayer is God's witness and testimony to us. Just as God would enter our world as Jesus, just as God in Jesus walked the dusty road to Calvary in the difficult world of his century, so God in Christ and Holy Spirit indwelling in us walks these roads with us here and now. This joining of testimonies and witness of God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, disciples, and us, and us, is a gift brought to us by the incarnate life of God. It bears witness to the powerful nature of grace and inclusion. God is at work in us and through us for the sake of this beloved world. And this week, we are again invited to take part in God's unfolding plans for the future. A person in right relationships with God and one another is expressed as one who trusts God's promises will come to fruition. As the psalmist proclaims, blessed is the person planted by the waters who bears much fruit. This prayer by Jesus trusts that God's promise will come to fruition not only in the disciples, but also in the future disciples, which is us now. Praise be to Jesus who prayed, trusting each of us, future disciples, that God's promises was, is, and will still come into fruition today. May it be so. Amen.
go forth into the world refreshed by the truth you have received from Christ and renewed by the knowledge that you belong to God. Go forth as witnesses to the love and life of Christ. Amen. Thank you.